Today, I want to see if I can make benzene from vitamins. This video is part one, where I'll synthesize aniline from vitamin B10. In the next, I'll run some tests to see what I can do to convert that to benzene, and finally, I'll scale whatever works up. This is benzene. It's a simple aromatic ring, shown here with each of its atoms, and simplified here. It is such a prototypical molecule in chemistry. This substructure is in so many different compounds, but benzene itself also has a lot of uses. It even used to be used extensively as a solvent until people realized how carcinogenic it is. Because of that, it's pretty hard for amateurs to get their hands on. The most common method to make in the laboratory is decarboxylating benzoic acid. And it works, but it requires temperatures too high for glass and has pretty low yields. It's just pretty obnoxious. So I wanted to try a new path, and I think I found one that starts from a vitamin. This is para-aminobenzoic acid, PABA, or vitamin B10. So non-toxic, it's literally a vitamin. But you can see here that just with a couple small modifications, you get your carcinogenic benzene. So how am I gonna actually knock off this amino group and this carboxyl group? I should be able to do it in two steps. First, just like the benzoic acid, I'll decarboxylate the PABA, leaving aniline. This will go much easier than de decarboxylating benzoic acid since this amino group activates the benzene ring. Then I need to find some way to reduce this amino group to hydrogen, and I have a few ideas that I'll get to later. In the meantime, let's make the aniline. All right. Here I have uh, vitamin B12, para-aminobenzoic acid, PABA, and we'll charge it to the flask and then we'll start the uh, decarboxylation. All right, let's call it. We got 400 grams in there. Leaves a decent amount enough in the bag, but that can be for future runs. All right, and we'll set this up for distillation, where it'll destructively decarboxylate the uh, para-aminobenzoic acid and collect our aniline. Here we've got an inverted funnel trap. This is to like decarboxylation blows like a lot of air as the carbon dioxide comes off. And so a lot of gas will push things through the condenser pretty quickly. And I don't want all the aniline just going into the air. So I'm going to add a, a funnel, crap, funnel trap to capture those vapors. And I'm going to put some sulfuric acid in there so that uh, the aniline turns into a salt and stays dissolved in the water. Let's just top it off with some of that. Now I'll just top it off with water so that uh, the funnel is submerged and so that it actually acts like a trap. That should be enough. And we are now ready to start the distillation. I've got a stir bar in here. Uh, just gotta crake the heat. This will all melt, uh, should compact quite a bit. Uh, conveniently, this reaction literally only takes uh, PABA and heat. Uh, don't have a thermometer installed right now. We don't really need that. We're gonna be redistilling it anyways. Uh, and then this goes into a flask, which I'll be redistilling it from. We have the trap I just mentioned. Uh, now all that's left is to turn on cooling and heating. This is a refrigerated circulator. And so this can actually, it'll apply, it's like basically a fridge in there that'll apply active cooling. And so let's go ahead and turn that on. Now we'll turn on the pump. And this is just a mixture of antifreeze and water. And that'll cool the condenser. Cool, now we should be good to go. It's just starting to melt. Some of it's boiling, and melting the stuff above it. Plenty of action at the vapor trap. This could be from carbon dioxide, or it could be literally just from hot air expanding. Starting at the beginnings of a vapor front, but no drips yet in the flask. The action is about 220, so hot enough to boil aniline, but most of that is probably just CO2. Um, we do have some aniline boiling in, but still none of it's made it over the condenser head, but you can see it condensing here, uh, but nothing in here yet. 
Uh, so it looks like a ton of boiling, but a lot of this is just carbon dioxide generation. For strips of cotton, say, now the stir bar is also just freed up. So yeah, this is going smoothly. All of the pop has fallen off the top. All right, I'm at a decent drip rate, but I gotta turn it on the heat. Don't wanna do a decarboxylation too fast or it'll blow over unreacted source material. Yeah, it's gotten going quite fast. And so I've turned off the heat and taken off the uh, insulation. And so this will calm down a bit, but plenty of headroom in the flask, so no risk of bumping or anything too spooky. While this is going on, let's talk about the reaction. So we are reacting uh, PABA uh, with the effect of heat. We are decarboxylating into aniline and carbon dioxide. So the way this works is PABA has an amino group and a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids are a super common organic acid. For instance, like acetic acid vinegar is just a carboxylic acid group with an additional carbon. So what's interesting about this is if you look at what is right here, that is a carbon and two oxygens or carbon dioxide. And so it's pretty like de decarboxylation reactions are pretty common because it's pretty easy to blow this off since carbon dioxide is a great leaving group, meaning it's happy to leave off as its own compound. In this case with aniline, uh, just heat is enough to do this. And so with the application of heat, it'll rip off this CO2. This hydrogen will then uh, join with the benzene ring and uh, we'll be left with aniline and carbon dioxide. And so in this case, the PABA has a rather high sublimation point, so it mostly stays in the flask. And uh, the aniline, as it's created, uh, boils off and uh, is distilled into this flask. Here's a time lapse of the distillation. Once there was headroom in the flask, I paused it for a bit just to add the rest of the packet of PABA. All right, decarboxylation is done. I've got the heat turned off as almost no more was coming over. Still got a bit coming over, but this is some nasty orange goo that I'd definitely like to stay behind. So this is cooling down. We got quite a good yield of aniline, still some positive pressure, but the aniline is uh, like has a really high index of refraction and so ends up looking really pretty. Like, look at that. So yeah, we'll wait for this to cool down and then we'll dry this and then redistill it. As it's cooling down, you can see why an inverted funnel trap uses a funnel. As uh, the pressure goes negative in the system, it sucks uh, the water back in, but since it's a funnel, it breaks the seal before it would actually go back and contaminate the product. And so it's still cooling. Um, got a good amount of aniline. Now it's cool. And we have what looks to be around 250 milliliters of aniline. An interesting crust, definitely pretty nasty. We'll see how fun that is to clean. And here's our crude product, around 270 milliliters of aniline. Looks pretty nice. There's definitely some water in it. You can see drops at the bottom. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll dry, we'll dry the aniline um, with a base sodium hydroxide. You can't use something like uh, calcium chloride here uh, because it'll react because calcium chloride is a slightly acidic salt and uh, aniline is a weak base. Then we'll add some sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide loves water, so it should absorb the water out of the solution, and then we can just filter it off and redistill it. This time when we redistill it, we'll be much more careful about the temperature control to make sure that we get just the aniline. During the decarboxylation, that's pretty impossible because uh, there's like so much carbon dioxide is being produced that'll just blow over a bunch of other vapors. I will say this aniline with its like quite high index of refraction is just so pretty. 
All right, now we're filtered through. Now I'll set up for distillation, and I'll actually add some aniline I made in a previous run to clean it up. A bit of milky distillate coming over at just over 100 C, so this is likely water or some other impurity, so I'll be changing the flask. All right, it's getting pretty close to the boiling point of aniline. And so I'm gonna swap out the flask pretty soon. Cause yeah, this milky distillate is probably mostly water and impurities. Guess I didn't dry it enough. And now the vapor temperature is largely stabilized, so this is this is aniline. Aniline has a boiling point of around 183, 184, so 182 is good with my uncalibrated thermometer. Yeah, so now we wait for this distillation and then weigh our final weigh and calculate our final yield. Just a little bit left, and we're letting that cool down, and then we'll bottle and weigh it. Setup is cool, now I can collect the aniline. Pretty nice. Cool, I'll store it in an amber bottle. This is the smallest one I have that'll fit this. Uh, this is from Carter Scientific. They make great bottles and a lot of glassware for good prices. And so this is pre-weighed, so we'll put it in here, give it away, and then we'll know our yield. Cool, and here we have it. This is 303 grams. 303 grams minus the 48 grams of old aniline that I added gives me 255 grams out of a possible 337 for a yield of 75.7%, which is pretty good and similar to what I've gotten in the past and to Corrosive Chemistry's video that I got the idea from. So shout out to him. And finally, a uh, shout out to my patrons, especially the VIP and premium patrons listed here. You all make videos like this possible. And stay tuned for the next parts of this synthesis. It's a fun one, and I expect to post the next parts in a couple weeks. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.